Welcome to She Ventures. I'm Doria, co-founder of Sensei. Listen to women who take risks, build community, and get shit done. Recording from Madison Avenue in New York City. Belinda, thank you so much for joining She Ventures. You're so welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Before diving into your financial services career, your successful entrepreneurial ventures, I want to speak briefly about you. Where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Summerfield, North Carolina, which is a, a rural suburb of Greensboro, North Carolina. And I grew up basically on a farm. Um, I sometimes lived with my grandparents, sometimes my parents, but it was all very close by and a very rural upbringing. What brought you to New York City? I know it's a long time between growing up and being yes. an adult. So basically, I went to Carolina uh, undergrad in Chapel Hill and then got a job at a bank in Winston-Salem. And it was while I was there that I kind of decided, you know, I wanted to explore a bigger city. And I met who would become my husband at that time as well, and he was also interested in, in moving. So we decided to pick five cities and apply for jobs, and whoever got one, we were going to move there. And we ended up moving to San Francisco. So I got to New York via San Francisco because the job that he ended up with relocated us to New York about a year and a half later. Okay, so San Francisco was the first stop, second stop New York. Exactly. And your interest in business seems consistent throughout your life. You focused on it in, in school and throughout your career. What drew you to it academically and professionally? You know, I took my first accounting class when I was in 10th grade. Um, I, math was always my favorite subject and I was always drawn to it. I mean, in 10th grade, I don't even remember what year that was, but it was in the 80s and that's where you did debits and credits in a very weird, you know, DOS-like program on a computer. I, I and, remember those days. And so I, I learned T accounts, you know, <laughs> at 15 years old. and thought I was, I'm going to be an accountant. And then I went to a little bit later and I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. And I just was always drawn to these businessy type careers. I got to Carolina, decided to apply for the business school. I got accepted. I just really appreciated, I don't know, I think it was just the way my brain works. Was there anything in growing up that made you look at entrepreneurship as a, as a child growing up? You know, when I was a child, I don't think I realized maybe the influence of my father on that topic, but he's an entrepreneur. He owns a jewelry store that he has had since I was probably two years old and still still runs it, you know, over 40 years later. Um, so yeah, watching him, watching the lifestyle that he had, I was definitely around entrepreneurship. My grandparents were entrepreneurs. That farm I mentioned, they grew vegetables on five acres. That was my summer job my whole life when I was growing up. And I went with them to the farmer's market two or three days a week to sell vegetables. So there was a lot of entrepreneurship just right in my own family. And I'm thinking about your your first venture, Butter Beans, and I, I can't help but draw a parallel between growing up on a farm in a rural area and then starting Butter Beans, which is a Brooklyn-based startup that prepares homemade healthy food for students and teachers. What was the genesis of that idea? Well, I'm sure it was everything coming completely full circle. Um, so at the time I started Butter Beans, my son, who is now 12, was about 18 months old, and he was in daycare. And one of the things I noticed was, even though they provided the food, it was a, it was kind of a boring menu. It was the, it wasn't bad food. Um, I'm sure it was organic as it could be, but it was the same food every single week. So Monday was always chicken and rice, and Tuesday was always mac and cheese. And so I was started to explore what do other people feed their kids. And I started to ask parents and heard this theme about how they would feed their children pasta at 6 o'clock and then put them to bed and then eat their own food that was different from that after the children were asleep. And I was in complete shock. This is not how I was raised. This is not something that resonated with me. And I did not understand why people would not teach their children how to eat vegetables and healthy the same way that they do. 
So I decided to do something about it. And I'm sure that, you know, my childhood being raised on that farm, knowing what it's like to pick a red tomato out of the garden and eat it that day on a tomato sandwich, there's no replacement for that kind of tomato, um, really, you know, struck a chord with me. And I, at the same time, met Felicia, who would become my co-founder, mm -hmm. who was a vegetarian, holistic health counselor, teacher, yoga person, um, who very much comes from this world as well and this perspective. And I was the business person, and we decided to get together and change the way children eat at school. And so you were off to the races. And what you're saying resonates with me. I, I'm not proud to say that both of my children are very picky eaters. And when they both turn out that way, you have to assume it's something to do with your parenting and, and not them necessarily. Not trying to judge. <laughs> But um, very true, children aren't around a lot of healthy options often. Um, so you bootstrapped butter beans. That's right. For nine years. That's exactly right. And as a fellow entrepreneur, I know how incredibly grueling that can be at times. Uh, what personal characteristics do you think helped you? Well, I am extremely optimistic. I think that helps a lot because if you can always see the glass half full, then even though the mountain in front of you may seem insurmountable sometimes, if you just take it one step at a time and recognize clearly that, well, I can get through that one step and then we'll take it from there, then you are able to keep going forward. Can you give me an example of that at the beginning? Well, I can give you one kind of like a couple years in. Sure. Um, it, we, it was kind of a crossroads moment. We had basically just become break even and we'd been growing. We grew every year quite a bit and we needed a bigger kitchen. We, we did not have a stable kitchen situation and we had a couple thousand meals that we needed to provide every day. And the only way to do that was to invest in a new kitchen. So I remember we were on winter break with the kids and we had gone and stayed at a friend's house and I was basically up every night talking with my husband about whether or not we should remortgage our apartment in order to get out you know the couple hundred thousand dollars we needed in order to invest in this kitchen in a business that had just become break even wow so it was a very stressful time um, to make a long story short we decided to go for it and had to come home and go through the process of remortgaging the apartment to take the cash out. And meanwhile, find a partner to go in on the kitchen with because it was a really expensive thing and we were trying to do it as cheaply as possible. So I found a partner that also needed a kitchen. We found a 5,000 square foot space, we rented it, and then we had to hire contractors and we needed cash sooner than the money even came in. Right. And at the time, my daughter, was in daycare or preschool and this mom who I shared pickup with I met her to get my daughter one day and she was like what's going on because she could tell by looking at my face that I was stressed and I was like I need fifty thousand dollars like yesterday to pay a plumber to come in and start this work right she called me that night and loaned me fifty thousand dollars just like that just like that I did not ask I would have never asked in a million years right but this is just kind of an example of a roller coaster that doesn't seem to ever end, you know, for a couple of months at a time when you're really trying to figure out how to put money into your company, whether to put money into your company and how you're going to grow it in order to make it worth it. I, I can't imagine how much that must have meant to you at that moment. Oh my God, I was probably crying. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a sign to, to move forward. And at that point, how many contracts did you have? Um, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't really remember, but I can tell you that, you know, it started with one. And after that first year, we were able to get like three more the next year, two more the next year, three more the next year. So we always had two to four more contracts each year until we got to about that break even point and then we were able to continue to grow as well after that. And was it you who was going in and pitching the business? Yes. 
um, I pretty much closed all the contracts. I mean, this was a very long sales process. And I mean, the sales process is usually, I mean, on the very short side, at the very end was maybe three months. Okay. Um, but before that, you know, in the beginning, it was like an 18 month, sometime two, three year process to get a deal because it's, it's first of all, year, any school contract is a year long. So if a school is looking in October, they may be looking for the next school year or the next school year. So hiring a salesperson that I couldn't afford to pay a proper salesperson salary to in New York City plus commissions, right. which was quite an investment for something that might not close for 18 months, never made sense for us. Were, were you doing this full time or were you working another job as well? It was 100% full time. 100% full time, which I can only imagine was 110% oh, of yes, your focus. Exactly. It was, it was all in. So in, I want to just pivot to the topic of nutrition for a moment. Um, I'm going to be a little bit provocative and say something that I hear often, which is organic. Organic to some people is a marketing ploy to charge more money for food. What do you say to that, firstly? So what I say to that is this, the margins on school lunch are very small. And people feel already that school lunch should be free, regardless of what it is, whether it's organic, whether it's garbage. They just feel like there's just this connotation. Mm -hmm. And so our mission was to teach children and their families how to make healthy food choices. And so we had to figure out what does healthy mean and where does organic fit in that. So we were very clear with families that if organic was available to us at a price that fit the budget that our pricing allowed, we would buy it. Right. But our priorities in terms of ingredients was on the proteins first and foremost. So we always bought proteins, the meats that were, that were no hormones, no antibiotics, et cetera, because we felt like that was really important. Um, our milk was grass-fed from the Hudson Valley. It was not organic, but it was local and it was grass-fed. So we cared deeply about the ingredients, but we made no, you know, we were very transparent about the fact that the majority of our ingredients are not organic. We buy something that's going to fit in a budget that the parents can afford to pay to have homemade meals from scratch served to their children every single day and not completely break the bank. If we had had organic, the only way to do that would be to have a cost plus contract with the school who was paying for 100% of everything. Right. That makes sense to me. And the schools that you won deals with were, I think, primarily private schools, correct? Um, they were in the beginning. Okay. I think after the fifth year, we um, entered the charter school territory as well. So in the private schools, the thing is we were also serving the, the, the smaller private schools. Right. When The way we got our foot in the door is by serving the schools that the larger companies, like the Flicks of the world, did not want to serve because they were too small. So their minimum is probably like six or 700 all-inclusive meal plans and obviously larger, and ours was 100. So that meant we had to meet the needs of a smaller private school community, which are different from a really large school. Right, that makes sense. And I would think that the bureaucracy of the public school system would be challenging for any business owner. Was that the case? I think that the public school system is a very political environment. Mm -hmm. They do their own school food. So a principal would have to make a decision to go up against the DOE and their food program. And I can't imagine any principal would want to put their job on the line for lunch. So, And I... I have not seen firsthand, but I've read that food that is often served in public schools is not optimal. Well, my children go to public school. Okay. So I've seen it. Okay. And unless you count mozzarella sticks as a proper main entree um, and frozen fruit icy with 28 ingredients, then you can decide. At, this, at the same time, though, uh, you know, I, I also have to be aware that for some kids in New York City, th this is the only meal that they get in a day. 
So the DOE has multiple menus. Okay. They have the regular menu, mm -hmm. which is the one with the mozzarella sticks, which is the one they serve to the majority of their schools. They have an alternative menu that actually does have some pretty good items on there. They have vegetarian option every single day, including organic tofu. They also have organic roasted chicken on that menu. I'm sure it's quite a bit more expensive than the regular menu. And the only way a school can get it is if the principal asks for it. And a lot of times, that is a very difficult conversation as well because it doesn't have any breaded items on the menu. That means no breaded chicken fingers. It also doesn't even have hamburgers on there anymore. So it's all healthy. And there are some schools where parents have gotten involved and demanded that they change to that alternative menu, but not most. So they do have it at their opportunity to do it. They can do it. I think the DOE knows how to do it. It's a matter of making it a priority. That's good to know. I didn't realize that. As far as your business uh, went, nine years, were there moments where you were completely fed up and considered returning to a cushy corporate job? No. <laughs> um, I would not characterize any corporate position I've ever had as cushy because of you know, the environment. Right. Um, I really appreciated working for myself and creating jobs and building teams in a way that I knew was based on a corporate culture mm -hmm. that was a win-win for every single employee. So I never, that to me was way more important than. And when you say win-win for each employee, how, how did you construct your company to be that way? Well, it, it's, the people are so incredibly important. And, you know, I can give you a couple of examples. My assistant had um, a couple of children and she lived within walking distance of our office. And one of the things that was important to her was to be able to pick her kids up off the bus. And in order for her to do that, she needed to have her hours structured so that that was possible. She also wanted to be able to go to her kid's school for the publishing party and for the birthday party. So that meant she would need to go be late to work 10 days a year and come in an hour late. And I just made that the rule that, you know, if your kid has a publishing party or if there's something going on, then you just go. You don't need to ask for extra time off. That was just part of the deal. And I structured her hours so that she could leave work and go get her kids off the bus. I had another employee who it was important to them to have their summer structured in such a way that they could take certain vacations with their kids. And we structured it around that. So I really wanted to take into consideration the specific needs of each individual and figure out how to make the policies consistent for each person that was on the, you know, on the team to be able to do that because I knew that without them that it would be very difficult to to manage our company. That's so true. Having a team around you that you can trust is so key. And I think work-life balance is key as well. And the fact that you were able to provide that, I think ultimately helps you as well as the business owner. Absolutely, be because they would totally drop anything and, and answer the phone anytime I called day or night, whether it was the weekend or whether during the week. Right. And, and so building a cohesive team is not an easy thing to do. Without going into too much detail, were there ever any times that you made a bad hire? And if so, how did you deal with that? Okay, there was a time I made a bad hire. And it was a very important position. It was a pretty senior position, and it was one that I had hoped would turn into, you know, an even more senior position. And basically, um, once I came to the realization that that wasn't going to happen because it was the wrong person, the way that I handled that was through making sure I had the right policies in place for my HR. I made sure that I went back and I revisited the job description of this individual and I evaluated what it needed to actually be. I started by rewriting their job description, having a conversation and saying, this is the job that you actually have. This is what I expect from you. Is this something that you feel like you can fulfill? And throughout the course of about a month, 
of going back and forth and having a conversation about what was actually expected of this position, it was a mutual agreement that this person would no longer be in this position, and she left. That's always difficult to to go through, and I think it's really important to set mutual goals from the beginning to make sure that both people understand. And oftentimes one might do that, but there's still miscommunication on what those goals are. Well, when you are in a growing startup, they change. It's virtually impossible because of that. They change. And sometimes you don't have the foresight to understand exactly what that job description needed to be. But then when you figure it out, you need to be very quick to be transparent and clear and say, listen, you know, this is not about you or whether you can do this or not, but this is what needs to happen. And this is what need in order for this job, this company to be successful. This is what this role needs to be. Can you take on this role? Are you in or are you out? Exactly. Um, that that makes a lot of sense and it allowed you to move forward. And it also makes me think about, you were talking about human resources. Are there things that you outsourced? Because that's something that as a startup ourselves, we struggle with. For example, Arindam is our accountant, which is really a, a mistake because he's overextended. and. Um, so you had mentioned HR. Did you did you outsource HR accounting? It was a big um, it was a big mix. So and it did change over time. So for example, um, for the first several years, I did outsource like the bookkeeping. Um, but at some point, it became so much that I brought it in house and I hired someone. But I did out, I'd never hired an in house CPA. We always outsourced the tax return. Um, in terms of HR, you know, I actually had a very good relationship with ADP. I know a lot of people that I talked to have not had a good relationship or experience with ADP. I had a fabulous experience with ADP, and they were my HR partner. They handled all of our payroll. They they have a whole team of attorneys that made sure we had the proper handbook in place. If I ever needed to have a difficult conversation, my HR partner was there for me to review everything with her first and then go have that conversation. She had every template under the sun that I could ever need. She did training for my supervisors once a month in their offices. It was extensive. So you had you had a lot of contacts through your previous life and networking. Exactly. And she I did have, you know, all the onboarding was done in-house. Okay. But ADP supported that. So if we had like an onboarding process and all the documents, then we would run that by ADP to say, are we in compliance? And if anything needed to be changed, then we would change it. Got it. I'm looking at your son who's joined us today as well, and and I'm just wondering, what about entrepreneurship would you like your son and your daughter to learn? Well, that's a very fascinating question because we definitely have a couple of budding entrepreneurs in our family. Um, My son is already prototyping his first, well, I don't know if it's his first, he's had many ideas, but this one he's gotten the furthest along with, and I will not tell you what it is or he will be very upset with me. Um, but he's already, you know, imagining how many sales he thinks he wants to grab for Christmas this year nice. for his first thing. So, yeah, I often say I have no idea if my children will go to college because I think they'll already have their own businesses long before then. And your daughter as well is, is an entrepreneur? She wants to be an actress, so we'll see um, if she, you know, goes for that and really does everything required to make that happen or but yeah she's got her own as soon as she hears my son talk about his ideas then she's jealous and wants to have her ideas too so then she comes up with hers which she came up with some pretty good ideas too so we'll see where she goes with that so you made the Inc. 5000 list two times uh, which is a benchmark of of success in 2016 you earned 3.9 million in revenue Yet, we hear a lot about women struggling. I looked at the most recent Inc. 500 list, and I noticed that only 12 of the 500 founders were female. And so I wondered, what do you think it was about you and your business that is different? Um, Probably that I bootstrapped, because only 3% of VC money goes to women founders, which is ridiculous, because I think more than 50% of founders are actually women. And the fact that I just decided to do it my own way and not go out and try to convince other investors to invest in my idea probably really cut through a lot of the 
conversations that would otherwise have to happen in order for me to move forward. And I just and I had a huge support system at home. My husband was incredibly supportive. Um, so, you know, I actually got laid off right before I started Butterbean. So I had a severance okay. and I used that um, along with whatever other money, you know, I had saved to start the company. And I ended up winning the NYU business plan competition um, that first year. I call it the pilot year, the first year. The same time we were writing the business plan as I went through that competition with my teammates. And we just went for it. We never really asked for permission. We just said, you know what, this needs to be done, and so let's go do this. Do you think women ask for permission often? I do. I think that they want validation. I think that's human nature. I think everybody wants validation, but I think some people maybe wait for it a little longer than, than they would otherwise if they just trusted their gut. So you trusted your gut, you went for it, you mortgaged your apartment and put everything in. You were all in. I was all in, for sure. You, you mentioned that you have, you have children, a husband, who were very supportive. To a, to a woman who wants to emulate what you've achieved, what would you tell her? I would tell her that whatever her ideas are, whatever her dreams are, she would not have them if she was not capable of achieving them. And if she's truly committed, and you have to be all in. I think Randy Zuckerberg said, friends, sleep, work, um, exercise. She listed like five things, and she was like, pick three. Because that's all you can really have. There's no more time for any more than that. And she's absolutely right. And sometimes you can only pick two. So you have to decide that you want to be all in and give up a few of your exercise days maybe or your friend lunches or whatever the case may be. If you really want it, you have to commit to it consistently every single day. This is not a part-time hobby. So I would say it's totally achievable if you make that decision and that commitment to go for it. And what did you have to sacrifice personally to be all in of those five things? I mean, I would definitely say my friends. Yeah. Um, and definitely, you know, once I had children, exercise went by the wayside. I understand that. <laughs> it is really hard to, to manage all of that. Are you, are you finding today, and we'll go into what you're doing today, but are you finding more of an equilibrium now? Yes. And that is a perfect segue into what I'm doing now. So when I had butter beans, I was working, you know, 60-ish hours a week. And the summer was the busiest time. You wouldn't expect that with school lunch. But that's the time when all of the new contracts were getting implemented and all of the schools needed help setting up their kitchens. We were writing the menus for the following year. We operated our own summer camp with two or three locations. We had several other camps that we were feeding. It was the busiest time. So I was working literally seven days a week during the summer, no vacation. So Butter Beans was acquired in uh, June of 2017. Can you disclose to whom or for how much? Sure, um, maybe not how much, but um, a, a man named Pat Persons is the current owner and CEO of Butter Beans, and he is managing it to its doing a great job and, and taking and continuing to see it succeed. Are you happy with what you sold it for? Very happy. Does it give you more flexibility to do what you want now? Yes. So the goal was to find a new business model that would allow me to work part-time and do the things that I want to do with my children now um, and, still, and still have a career and still work. So it sounds like the nine years, the, the difficulty and, and the, the great moments of Butter Beans, you would, you would do again. What were the biggest lessons that you learned? So the biggest lessons that I would learn, I mean, because I definitely jumped in from the perspective of I want to fix school lunch. It was very much a product-centric decision. If I were to do it again, which I'm doing now, I would very much think about um, the business model and what are the profit margins of the business model to understand with a little more clarity before I started what is it going to take to get break even and what does that look like from a, you know from a couple of different perspectives what 
you know, what are the, from a business model, you look at many different things. Like what is, what's the cash flow of that business model? What is the, um, you know, urgency of that business model? You know, when you're serving lunch, it can't be late. It has to be on time. Like there's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's as much a logistics company as it is a food company. And a high pressure company. It, very much so. And it's a seven day a week company. There's no days off. So I, looking at the business model and understanding what are the needs of your clientele? What is the expectation of response time? All of those things. Um, and understanding how to structure them in order, you know, before you say, yeah, that's going to work for me. And, and I, when you're saying this, I'm thinking that you also got your MBA from Stern. Would you say that it's one thing to learn it in a classroom. It's a whole other thing to implement it in real life. Absolutely, but I see value in both. Okay. Um, I feel like whenever you have work experience, you know how to do something. And when you have the formal education to go along with it, you know how to describe it. That's kind of the way I see things. I remember I had a job interview when I was first moved to San Francisco and I was trying to get a job. I got an interview with Hembrick and Quist, which is an investment bank that no longer exists. And... Um, the interviewer asked me if I'd ever done any modeling in Excel. And I was like, no, I, I really haven't. And then I went home and I was like, wait a minute. Were all those projections that I did for all those companies for the past year and a half, was that modeling in Excel? Like, of course it was. Yeah. I just didn't have the language to use for it. Right. So that's what I feel like a formal education can give you. It can give you the, the articulation in order to explain what it is you're doing in a way that will actually make you go further. And legitimize and be able to talk the language. Yeah. So now you're involved in two ventures from what I can see. You created a five-week online course on a platform called Teachable. And it's called Launch Your Business from Scratch Without Writing a Business Plan. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yes, I'm very excited about this. It actually is going to be kicking off this Friday, October 19th. Exciting. Which I'm so excited about. And... It's kind of funny because I've known I wanted to do this for a while now. I mean, it's it's been a couple, it's been some time since I decided to sell butter beans, and I've been thinking about what I want to do. It's been a few years, and as I've been doing research to understand what this was, what this really was, what is the need, who wants education online, um, I started to think, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna teach business owners who already have their businesses on how to be more um, optimized for what they're doing do things in a smarter way, apply systems that they might not otherwise know about. And when I interviewed them, they they didn't seem to like really resonate with what I was talking about with my classes. So I thought, all right, well, maybe that's the wrong market. So then I went back to the drawing board and I decided, all right, I'm going to target people who want to start a business but haven't really started yet. So that's when I redid the course, the outline, and I created this new one, Launch Your Business Without a Business Plan. And I started talking to people about who might want to sign up. And the first two people that signed up already have their business and just wanted to learn. So I thought that was kind of funny yeah. to see who actually signed up first. Um, and then I do have a couple of other people who have signed up that are um, that are new and exploring new concepts. This is the first class and it's a pilot class, which is really exciting because it's going to be delivered live and in, it's going to be on video, it's going to be online, but it's going to be live. So it's going to be really exciting for everybody to have a lot of direct access to me and for me to learn from them, and I'm really looking forward to it. So based on this, then you'll um, iterate from there. Exactly. So with all of the feedback, I'm going to take it back. I'm going to edit and create videos that have content that teach the subject matter. That will be packaged up, and then that will be sold as a standalone product. Can you give us a sneak, sneak peek as to one of the lessons? Sure. So the very first lesson I will tell you a little bit about is for if you are starting a new business, then one of the things you have to figure out is kind of like your 30-second pitch or your three-minute pitch. If you already have a business, sometimes you still need to work on that, but you also need to really understand your engagement with your customers. And in either case, you want to understand your customer's journey so that you will really appreciate the value that they are getting out of what it is you are offering. So in our first lesson, students are gonna learn how to map out their customer's journey starting before they even know you exist. So if your problem is bad breath, 
you know what? You didn't start by noticing that in, you know, Walgreens looking at the toothpaste dial. You noticed it at home. So right. where does your journey start? And then what are all the steps along the way? And then figure out where can you engage with your customer? You know, is it through a commercial? Is it through, an, a, you know, some other kind of ad? Is it through a YouTube video? Whatever the case may be, until they finally come across your product and then you can convince them to buy. So it's going to be an understanding of that process. That sounds ex- exciting and I think really interesting and it makes me reflect upon Sensei as well and, and it is a challenge to figure out the various touch points of your customer's journey and how they're going to come across right. your product. If, if you had to point to one mistake that you think entrepreneurs invariably make, what would that be and how does your course address it? So in the context of my course, okay, so one of the things that my course is going to touch upon, I mean, this is a new course that hasn't, you know, gone through its first iteration yet. So one of the things I've done is I've given a survey to the students that are going to be coming on board to find out what are your expectations and what are you hoping to get out of there. Um, So some of the things that people want to get out of there is, is about pricing. How do I price my product? And that's an example of where I think that a lot of entrepreneurs go wrong. And I made these mistakes too. You know, when I was at Butterbeans, I priced lunch at first at what I thought people would pay, which is not really how you want to price your product. So just understanding the psychology behind pricing, why people make a buying decision, taking them through that, um, I think that, that they will be able to learn a little bit about that from this first course. I was thinking about that as you, as you said that, and uh, I think pricing is something that is a really difficult thing to get right and it ultimately will dictate whether you succeed or fail. Yes, it will. <laughs> that is exactly right and that's why it's so important to get right. And so how did you decide on the pricing of your current course? So the, the price of the, the pilot course is $197, mm-hmm. which is a bargain for what you're going to be getting. And the reason that I priced it that way is because it's the first one. Right. So after this course, um, The price is going to go up quite a bit for that packaged online version. One of the things that I did to um, set the initial prices was to go and see what else is out there to understand what other products are being sold and for what price and for what you're going to be getting. And, you know, one of the things that nobody else is going to get except for in my courses, of course, is access to me and the community that I'm building. So that's definitely a a unique differentiator. But at the same time, it's very important to me that All of the millions of entrepreneurs that want access to this kind of education have access. So I anticipate that my first course that I launched, that's the packaged video version, will be around six classes long Mm -hmm. with maybe one or two office hours for live Q&A back and forth in between. And that will run around $347. So it's a very affordable price still. But there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there that do not, that that's a lot of money for. Yes, absolutely. And so I don't want to make this product exclusive. I want to make it available to anyone who wants to make that commitment, like I was talking about earlier, and make the plunge and invest in themselves. And, and so you're open to working with people if they need to have some sort of discount is that what you're alluding to? Not really. <laughs> what I'm saying is that the price is going to be set at a point where if you needed to put it on a credit card and pay it off over Got three it. months, okay. you can do that as opposed to, wow, that's a $3,000 course. I can never afford it. Right. So you obviously have done your market research. You've done a lot of things that I think someone who is an entrepreneur has already had a successful exit does. Um, You've surveyed your competition. How are you approaching the unknowns of your latest business? I hired a coach. So, you know, I need help too. I'm a solopreneur all over again. And it's lonely at the top, as anybody who's in that situation can attest to. So I have um, engaged with a coaching program that specializes in online education to learn all of the millions of things that I do not know how to do and I'm going to have to learn like Google Analytics and a lot of other things that I know nothing about at this moment right. where when I had Butterbeans I had a team and I could say oh go do this or go do that I can't do that anymore so until I get to that point is it helpful very helpful 
Excellent. A lot of people are creating online courses now, I've noticed, as, and as you alluded to. Why do you think this trend is emerging? Oh, gosh, there's so many reasons. I mean, one, look at the price of college and universities. It's yeah. skyrocketing. I mean, it's growing at such a faster rate than inflation. And um, it's really not possible for many families. And not to mention the fact that a lot of graduates aren't actually getting good jobs. And they're working in fields that are very different from what they studied because they can't get a job in their field or can't you know, take that low pay that that field pays. So I think that people are rethinking how they educate themselves in order to a- accomplish their dreams. Um, I think it's convenient. I think particularly, you know, we have the millennial generation that is interested in a customized sort of education that this allows them to study what they want to study, what's actually interesting to them. Over 50% of millennial parents, which can you believe they're having children now, um, believe that high school should require at least one online course. So they very much have embraced the online education space. Um, and believe that their children should have access to it. They themselves, over 50% of them, have taken an online course in one thing or another. Um, So it's affordable, it's convenient, it's practical. And then you have the Generation Z, the now generation. Actually, my son has a friend who's 12 and does homeschooling. Mm -hmm. So he does all of his education online. He's in Florida. And he has a teacher. Florida offers homeschooling for free to parents, full teachers, everything online. The parents don't have to teach them. Yes. So this child plays tennis four hours a day and works out even more than that. So he has a path to go down this tennis path. So that's why he does homeschooling. So I ask him, what about this online education do you like and what do you not like? And his response was, one of the things I don't like is sometimes the teacher takes like two hours to get back to me whenever I ask her a question. And I said, how long do you think it should take? And he's like, 30 minutes. So the reason that the now generation is called the now generation is because they want it right now, not two hours from now, but right now. So I think that we have to understand how to meet the needs of these, of this new generation, even beyond the the millennials who are, by the way, going to be 80% of our workforce by 2024, um, to understand how to, how to meet these needs. And I think that online education is going to play a big role in all of that. How do you scale an infopreneur business without overextending yourself? That is an excellent question. And when I figure out the answer to it, I'll be glad to get back to you because I think it's going to be difficult for me to hold office hours for every single, you know, new class once it grows to a certain point. But I will say that I do believe that the community that is going to be built is going to be huge because peer to peer advisement is going to have to play a role. You know, I'm a member of an organization called the Women's Presidents Organization. And the purpose of that is to have peer to peer advisement. You know, we have meetings once a month we get together we're all women who've owned businesses that have been pretty successful in order to bounce ideas share war stories and help each other out and the same thing is going to be true of this next generation of entrepreneurs even if they don't plan on growing their business to be millions and to sell it they're still going to need help and i do think that the network that that i'm going to be building is going to be very important one of the things that i notice my gen zers doing is watching a lot of youtube Do you think that the free information on YouTube is going to make it more difficult for you to sell your course over time? I think it's going to make it easier because the free content that's on YouTube is it's it's creating curiosity. It's creating them to want to know more. Mm -hmm. And the free content is only going to go so far. And after, at some point, you're going to need like an in-depth, handheld lesson on how to actually do something. I'm going to be providing hundreds of templates, if not thousands at some point, that are basically paint by numbers on how to write a job description. You're not going to get that for free on YouTube. So it's, it's more of like almost like a top funnel to then search deeper. Absolutely. I'll be putting my own free stuff on YouTube just to get people excited about it. Right. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great way to get uh, people interested in what you're doing getting back to so now you're doing these ventures and I'll talk about your second one in a moment you you mentioned that you wanted to find something that allowed you to spend time with your children and also work 
So my question is, have you ever experienced mom guilt? And how do you find enough time today to spend with your kids and to take care of yourself and your relationship? Okay, so I have definitely experienced mom guilt. Um, You know, off the top of my head, I wish I, I can't really think of an exact story, but I remember the feeling of just feeling like a horrible person that my child had some great event going on that I just could not attend. Um, but I guess I've had that happen enough times now where I'm I'm pretty much over that now at this point. Um, if I can't be there, then I just like to tell them that I'm proud of them and that I'm sure they're going to do great and I want to see the pictures. Right. So I've moved through that process. I remember the very first day I dropped my son off at daycare, the very first day. That was the hardest day of my life. Actually, the second day was the hardest. The first day was hard, but the second day was like I took him back um, because I swear they mixed the breast milk between me and another one I gave my child. So I, I was like a wreck. Um, so definitely have felt mom guilt. And the way that I try to balance it all now is, you know, I, I'm now probably working 25 hours a week. But I also, I, I'm somebody who also structure, thrives well on structures in my life. Mm-hmm. So I'm the PTA treasurer for my son's school. I am the... Girl Scout troop leader for my daughter. Last year I was her class parent. So if I sign up for these things that I even don't really have time for, I know I will do them. I will make time for them and by definition be involved in their lives. So I find ways to insert myself in things that I know I'm good at, that I'm capable of accomplishing. Um, and, and it, you know, now there's a Girl Scout weekend that we're going to go on, you know, that would not exist if I were not the troop leader. So Th- that's wonderful that you get to share that with your children. Do you think that? men experience that same sort of guilt? Um, yeah, I do. And I don't know that they all express it in the exact same way. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that maybe even sometimes it could be even subconscious and they're not even aware of it. But I do, you know, I remember when I was in college, um, I worked as a bookkeeper for this company and it was like this investment company. And I remember one of the guys there that was working there, he was like 50 and he was extremely smart. He had just moved to Chapel Hill and he left this really big job to come there. And I said to him, why did you move here? Like you had such a great job in like on Wall Street. He said, I missed the first 10 years of my son's life. I don't wanna miss anymore. So he made a decision and I'm sure during that 10 years, he wasn't like at home you know, crying about it every day. Right. He just woke up one day and realized it and then decided to make a change. So I'm not sure it, you know, it's expressed in the same way for men and women. Right. And not even maybe men to men. Um, but I do think that, that men do care about those experiences with their kids. So today you have a new venture, another new venture, and it's called Choose Your Metric. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So Choose Your Metric is a coaching business where I offer one-on-one private coaching to business owners who are interested in gaining more training, more general basic business knowledge, and account being held accountable to the decisions that they're making and the commitments that they're making. And it also plays an advisory role when they're trying to make a big decision. So my, my target client for this is someone who's maybe 250000 to $5 million in sales. Mm-hmm. It's that you know small business section, not really SMB, but small business. Um, because what these business owners are trying to accomplish is to grow, to grow their business or take it up a level. And they're recognizing they don't know how to do that. What they've done to get them to the level they are now is different from what they're going to have to do to get to the next level. And so they've recognized, wow, the last three or four years I've had the same goals and nothing's really changed. Why is that? And so that's when the, you know I try to help them understand you haven't changed. You're not doing anything different. So there's real no reason to expect anything to be different with your business. And so we talk about what their goals are what strategies they are employing to reach those goals, and how they need to go about that in order to make that happen. So I would assume that it's based on your experience from Butterbeans, you had gotten to that place yourself. And what, can you give me an example of 
what kind of challenges are different for a business at that stage? Okay, sure. And this is, and I will say that most of my clients do not have formal business um, ed- education. Right. So they don't have the the vernacular. They don't have the Porter's five forces. They don't have the strategy explanation that you get whenever you're in business school, and that they can give you language and that aha moment. Of, oh, that's what that is. Right. So you know, I'll give you an example. So, you know, clients who want to grow. Um, I'll ask them, well, tell me about your, your, you know, your prospects. Tell me who are you targeting and, and how many people are on your list of, of prospects right now that you know you can sell into. And they sit there and they're literally coming up with this out of their head because it's certainly not written down on any piece of paper. And then we start to introduce the concept of a sales cycle, the concept of you know, sales stages to help them understand that whenever a customer buys from them, they're actually going through a process. So, so these are people that have gotten to three million in revenue without understanding a sales cycle. Yes, this is dependent upon industry. If you get lucky enough to happen upon yourself making three million dollars, it's because you had a really good idea. Right. If you didn't really know much about how to build a business, and that absolutely happens. How many of your clients are that way? Oh, I, you know, a couple. It, I mean, a lot. Most of the time, you know, you're talking about sub million dollar sales at that point. Right. But you would be surprised at how many businesses out there are even a million dollars or more, and they got there because they had a really good product. And, and so are you hoping also that your online business will feed into the coaching business in some way? You know, I'm letting whatever's going to happen, happen. So I'm not, I don't have some grand vision about the mix of coaching versus online. I want to, I want, my mission is to help the millions of people out there that want to start a business, know how to do so confidently, have the skills and the information that they need to do so to help them. So if that's through online courses, if that's through coaching, I feel like it's going to all manifest the way it's supposed to. Right. So... So more of a social question here, but we've been hearing a lot about the Me Too movement. How did you handle any social hurdles that you had? Um, or, or what would you advise women who face them in entrepreneurship? Well, regardless of whether it's entrepreneurship or whether you're in a corporate job, right. I, I feel like you need to have advocates in your life and and mentors to help you keep your eye on the ball. I think a lot of people get distracted with what's important, whether it be a title or a certain type of promotion or to gain that one client if you're an entrepreneur. If they make one thing the end all and they attach that one thing as their goal and if they, they miss it, then they feel like a failure. But you really need to find something that's definitely attainable, set smart goals, and then find people that are around you to help you, support you, to keep your eye on that ball, to keep you moving forward. Because it, it can be really difficult when you're in a situation without any support. Right. If you're feeling like, I'm never going to get promoted, ever, or... My, I'm never going to get as many clients as I need or I can't get that vendor to work with me and I really need them to. If you feel that way, then it's a lot harder to make progress because you're kind of down and the energy's down. But if you support yourself with people who can help you see through those clouds sometimes and recognize you're going to get through this and none of this stuff matters anyway, mm-hmm. then it will really help you. And sometimes that might come in the form of hiring a coach. I mean, regardless of whether you're an AVP or an SVP or an owner or whatever the case may be, wherever you can get the support that you need mm-hmm. to, based on your personality, based on your skill set, your knowledge, your goals, whatever it is, then surround yourself with people that, are, that can help you get there. So... Maybe asking the question another way, you have been in industries that are typically male-dominated, business, 
financial services. Well, well business financial services, but also um, the culinary industry is yes. is very male dominated as well as well. So, have you had any hurdles being a woman? You know, I hate to be the exception, but I really don't feel so. And maybe it's because I just don't look at it that way. Um, you know, I was watching this Saturday Night Live skit where this, that woman prosecutor that they brought in to, to do this trial last week, mm -hmm. she said, I know everybody keeps referring to me as the woman, you know, attorney, but it's okay if you just refer to me as an attorney. <laughs> that's really okay. You know, that's my, that's my perspective. That's how I feel about myself. Like, I'm just a business person. Even though I recognize that it's my role as a female mentor to other female entrepreneurs, I recognize the importance of that role. So I am not going to pretend like it's not harder for women because it absolutely is. But for me, I choose not to see it that way in my own business. Right. I just don't even look at it. So as you know, I, I've co-founded a financial literacy platform called Sensei, where we want to help everyone learn about personal finance. And in that regard, do you think there is a disparity between men and women in economics? I know that you say in your personal life you haven't felt it, but overall, have you seen it? Yes. I even saw it with myself. When I was working in corporate America, I was making less money than an employee that reported to me made. So, but I did not choose to focus on it and let it get me down. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do something about it. So that's why I say I choose not to look at it for myself. But I absolutely see it for other people. Um, and I think there's a variety of reasons for that. Women are afraid to ask for the money and men aren't. That's number one. And that comes from whether you're an entrepreneur or not because it comes down to pricing. I have a client who literally is like, gosh, I have such a hard time charging X for this product when I know it only costs me Y to make. And I'm like, get that out of your head right now. <laughs> because the price of this product is how much you can possibly sell it for en masse. Like, that's the price. It has nothing to do with what you paid to have it made. Right. But this is stuck in, you know, her head. But a man would never say that. He would be like, I'm going to charge as much as I possibly can and not think twice about it. So I think there is a mentality that needs to be shifted for people to understand this is an economic decision. If you make more money, you can hire more money. That means you're creating more jobs. Let's look at this from a holistic macro perspective, not just this one little factor of piece of information. So, so you are a fighter and you have not let anything really get you down and you've just decided to focus and it seems as though you have a, a laser-like focus on everything that you do. Yeah, I mean, I really do. And I also at the same time believe that stressing out about it or worrying about things, I've done plenty of that, don't get me wrong, like when I was deciding whether or not to remortgage my house, but it doesn't help. And so over the years, I've learned to say, you know what, if I'm stressed right now, I need to sit down and I need to meditate for a minute and just remind myself that whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. I have no control over that ultimately. So I might as well just be prepared for whatever happens. Where can our listeners find you, Belinda? You can come to my website. Um, I'll give you a shortcut to it because my name's kind of long. Um, you can go to BelindaDI.com and it will take you to BelindaDGiambatista.com. Wonderful. And your course is on Teachable. Is that also on your website? You can access it through the homepage of my website as well. Excellent. Thank you. It's really been nice uh, speaking with you. Thank you so much. You've been listening to She Ventures. Like what you heard? Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts and sign up for our newsletter so you never miss a show.